So I think we have time for perhaps one or two questions. Microphone number two. So, uh, Sharon, very, very good talk Bye -bye. over here. So, um, I just want to ask your opinion about the potential role in the near future of big data and computer analytics to overcome some, not all, but some of these observational uh, studies uh, bias. So. so, I certainly think it has potential, mainly because I think with with big data analytics, we may be able to capture more information. So a lot of the observational data we have now is either cancer registry data or administrative claims data, which don't have the clinical richness. So I do think that um, having sort of big data analytics could improve that because you're going to get much, you have the potential anyway of getting much more detailed and comprehensive data. But whether or not that's really enough to, to overcome um, fully all the biases, I, I'm not sure. Number two. Yeah, I'm Rutgers Amsterdam. Thank you, Dr. Good. Dr. Giordano. Um, we are struggling with this non-inferiority trials in events where the number of events is extremely low. For instance, less than 1% per year. For instance, a local relapse after breast conservation or an effect central node biopsy. I have the, uh, the um, example of the Amaros, which was underpowered because of the low number of events. Do you think, do you believe that we should come to a system where the number of events is very low, that we can do prospective observational studies with preset statistics um, without randomization? Please, say yes. <laughs> I would say I'm very biased about this because we I was part of the APT trial it's and think it's something that we have to move towards and use our registries, do prospective analyses. I do think that uh, caveats aside and biases aside, observational data are helpful in many ways as long as you control for the biases and the comorbidities and confounders. And sometimes with a very rare outcome, there is no other way. I mean, you will never have a trial that has the sufficient number of patients to answer those questions. It's not possible. So there's, it yeah. almost has to be. Last question before lunch. So those were uh, two of the most uh, practical, informative, and animated talks I've heard in a long time. Thank you both very much. Uh, I do have a question, though. So, um, you know, the, 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 the whole paradigm of shared decision making is, is obvious, but it's not always so easy. And I wonder what you think um, the potential is of doing some training for patients before they meet with us to try to get them in the right space as well. So I, I can start. I, I think that's a terrific idea, and there are studies underway where people are given, and have been done, where patients are primed with the decision support tool before they see the physician, most notably right now in the surgical space, where they're making decisions about their local therapy options, where we encourage them, or it's part of the research, to look at the decision support tool before they see the clinician to make the most of the time. And, and the Society of Decision, decision SDM, I forget what it's decision making, actually, Society of Medical Decision Making, thank you, actually supports doing just that and getting a decision support tool into a person's hands before they even see the doctor when they know what the decisions are going to be for things like hip replacement or early breast cancer care where, you know, there are lots of choices and patients should have their preferences weigh in. Or I think you know, or even having the information between visits. So maybe they have their initial visit, but the decision isn't made, and then they can go home with the information so they can process it, discuss it with their family members, think about it before coming back, and you're not you know, going through all of that over and over again in clinic. Well, thanks again very, very much, and enjoy lunch. <laughs>